All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the world's greatest Bronze Age comic book podcast, Flea Market Fantasy. I am your co-host, Mike Allen, as always, I'm joined by... Michael Dell of the LCS Hockey Radio. Woo, all right. And uh, this week, it is your pick, and why don't you tell everybody what we are discussing. Well, Mike Allen, when I made this pick, I kind of forgot that it is your favorite time of the year. Woo, that's right. Tell, tell the people what it is. Shocktober! <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yep. Every, every year, Mike Allen gets excited. For Shocktober, <laughs> or he likes to do horror comics, and right. so this is kind of a horror comic. He started this character started out in a horror comic. <clears throat> yes, right. Yes, so but Mar- by seventies Marvel standards, this is definitely a horror comic. I would say. Yeah. So today we're doing Man Thing issue four, nineteen seventy five. That's right. Man Thing. <laughs> now, now, Mike, oh, our buddy Kevin Jenk pointed something out to me the other day when I told him we were doing Man Thing. Okay. He said, well, that, yeah, it's just a, like a, a euphemism for, uh, for a penis. <laughs> I, ah. I, I swear to God, I never thought of that. <laughs> Are you familiar with the series Giant Size Man thing? <laughs> yes. Because we'll that, talk about yes. That. We'll All right. Not a little later. But I swear to God, I never even put the two, to, uh, two and two together. <laughs> I never made Ooh. that connection. <laughs> yes. yes, I've, but, but it's crossed thing. my mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So here you go. Now, uh, Man Thing, the character is uh, Dr. Theodore Salas, and his first appearance was in Savage Tales number one, 1971. Huh. Uh, did you ever read any of Savage Tales? Uh, well, I have the Man Thing, what's it called, uh, Essentials, so it's probably in there, so I've probably read it. Yeah, because I went back and looked at Savage Tales number one here, and it's like a uh, black and white anthology. Like a big guy, yes. uh, it's got like Conan and uh, uh, who else is in there? I don't know, just some other random things. And then sure, I think there. there might have been a Punisher story in there somewhere. I think not in that one. This is too oh, early. Okay, for oh, okay. But um, the thing that I noticed is all the stories have scantily clad ladies, really doing sexually suggestive things. Huh. <laughs> yes. So now Mike L is going <laughs> to hurry up and read. <laughs> Scope those out. Savage Tales, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's where he made his first appearance. And the creators of Man Thing were Stan Lee, Roy the Boy Thomas, <laughs> Jerry Conway, and artist Gray Morrow. Okay, okay. Four people. Gray right. Man Stan Lee came up with a name. It was his okay. idea to go with Man Thing. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait, Mike, oh, I'm sorry. I think I bump my microphone off here. All right. <laughs> anyway. uh, sounds sounds the same. <laughs> All right, let's hope. <laughs> All right. But uh so yeah, Stanley came up with the name man thing. Roy Thomas did not like the name because he thought, hey, we already have a thing in the Fantastic Four. Mm, good point. Just gonna, just gonna confuse people, man thing and thing. But, right. Uh Stanley liked the names, they owned that. Roy Thomas plotted the uh, uh the story and then Jerry Conway scripted it and uh Gray Morrow drew it. Now, I, I'm not familiar with Gray Morrow. Are you, uh... Yeah, I mean, the only thing I really know about him, he did a ton of work, I think, at DC, and he's just a very realistic artist. That's all I really yeah. know about him. Yeah, I read that Savage Tales one there, uh, and uh, or at least I flipped through it, but his art was good. Was right, nice. right. Uh, I enjoyed it. All right, so uh, the character, uh, we mentioned Dr. Theodore Salas, and he's a biochemist working in the Florida Everglades. Hmm. And he was attempting to recreate the super soldier serum. Okay. But some uh, AIM agents came down to try and steal the formula. And, uh, oh, he also had a lover named, okay. uh, I think, Ellen Brandt. Okay. And uh, she was actually a spy, and she betrayed him, like, to AIM. So they uh, ransacked his laboratory, but he destroyed all his files. And then he was trying to escape from them, and they were shooting at his car. And he had only one uh, thing, bowel of the serum left. So he injected it into his arm. And I don't know why. <laughs> I guess okay. to see, see if it could save him, you know, make him a super soldier. Uh, but uh, the uh, AIM agents forced him off, in, off the road into a swamp, and his car crashed, and they thought he died. But no, he didn't die, Michael. He emerged as the man thing. Really? Now, yes. can I point out something about yes. everything you're telling me? This yes. sounds oddly familiar. <laughs> yes. Because uh, we, we did our swamp thing issue back in the day, 
the exact same story. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, exactly. Except instead of a uh, being like driven off the road into the swamp, I believe in the swamp thing, his lab blows up and he's like catches on fire and he runs right. into this. Um, but also the man thing, the swamp's also a mystical swamp. It's like the nexus of the universe. Right, so, right. So there's magical powers. And so it, the combination of the serum and the magic of the swamp turn him into man thing. Okay, okay. But it's the same goddamn thing. Yeah, it's so, the exact uh, same, yep. <laughs> so how did this happen, Michael? Well, I think we touched about this on, on this little bit in the swamp thing issue or episode. But uh, Jerry Conway and Len Wein were roommates at the time. Right, exactly. So, yes. So Conway, uh, he wrote uh, the first issue. Like I said, the first issue of Man Thing came out in May of 1971, and then Len Wein, he wrote the second issue that would feature the Man Thing, and it was going. But here's the problem: uh, the uh, I think the uh, Savage Tales ended. Okay. Like the, the, it was only around like a year or something, so they shelved the story. And uh, it wouldn't see print until Astonishing Tales issue 12 in June of 1972. Okay. Now, okay. in that time between when uh, Len Wein wrote that issue and when it got published, he went to D.C. and he wrote uh, the first ever appearance of Swamp Thing in House of Secrets issue 92, ah. July of 71. Okay. So, like, three months after Man Thing made his appearance, within that gap there, Len Wein went to dc and created swamp thing how did he ever come up with that idea i'm sure oh it's a coincidence God. right yeah <laughs> well, apparently jerry conway pointed it out to him that hey this is the same goddamn thing i did <laughs> and len one said no it's completely different i don't see anything <laughs> i don't see any similarities but i guess marvel never sued them or anything they never right. never got to the point of like a legal dispute because you know it's a man thing and swamp thing who cares right but so then the first issue of Swamp Thing came out in November of 1972. But okay. yeah, it's just completely ripped off from Man Thing. And apparently now Swamp Thing, uh, he kind of looks like a guy, you know, but he's made right. out of like swamp and plant stuff. Right. But Man Thing, Michael, he looks different. Would you care to describe what Man Thing looks like? Uh, well, his body is like that of a human, but very large. Uh, he has. You know, like like you know, like vegetation and grass and stuff growing out of his body, just like Swamp Thing. But then, when it comes to the face, he has red, big bulging eyes, and his most unique feature is, is that he has no discernible like mouth or nose. He just has. It almost looks like, like you know, three trunks. Like it's almost yeah. like he has like a long little trunk in the middle, and then two eyebrows that form two other trunks on the outside. So yeah. Like three he elephants unique trunks face. hanging off his face. Right. And, and he always kind of reminds me of Snuffleupagus from uh, Sith. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's Man Thing. And uh, he got a... So he got his own series then. Uh, well, well, first he got a 10-page recurring feature in Adventure into Fear. And that okay. started with issue 10 in October of 1972. Jerry Conway and Howard Chaikin did the first issue. Then Steve Gerber took over as the writer. And they had a few different artists follow up. But uh, so, but the feature, I guess it was popular. So it started getting bigger each time out until it eventually reached 19 pages in issue 15. And then the feature ended with issue 19. Because then it got its, uh, Man Thing got his own series. And that's what we'll be reading here today. And that started in January of 1974. And it ran for 22 issues. And we will be reading issue four. Steve Gerber wrote all 22 issues. And okay. the artist for the book we're reading is Val Mayrick. And he wrote the first, he did all those uh, adventure into fear issues. And then he did the first four issues of the regular. So, so why did that. you pick number four? Because I saw it had uh, a fella called the fool killer in it. Ah, yes. Fool killer. I like him. We'll talk about him in a minute. So uh, after during this time that the regular series was going on, as you mentioned earlier, there's also a quarterly giant size man thing. Yeah. Five. And uh, <laughs> that featured an original man thing story. And then the backup stories would be classic reprints of horror stories from the fifties and sixties. But Very issues cool. four and five 
they also had Howard the Duck stories in there because Howard the Duck made his first appearance in Adventure into Fear issue 19 as a supporting character in a man thing story. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> and Howard the Duck was co-created by Steve Gerber and Val Mayerick. Yes. And creative team we're reading today. So without man thing, there's no Swamp Thing and no Howard the Duck. Um, That's right. Man, man Thing also got another series in 1979, and uh, that only lasted 11 issues. The creative team to start was Michael Fleischer was the writer. Okay. And uh, Jim Mooney was the artist. But I guess after three issues, uh, the fan feedback was so negative, they uh, got Oof. rid of Michael Fleischer. Because he was, are you familiar with his work? I don't remember. Yeah, he did. I believe he did Ghost Rider. He did Justice League. He did a bunch of stuff around that time. Okay. Well, no one really liked his man thing stuff. So they got rid of him. And do you know who replaced him? Uh, let me guess. Jerry Conway. Chris Claremont. Really? Oh, I, had, I think I knew that. Okay. I, I had no idea. I never knew that. And, and I guess one of the gimmicks, uh, Gerber, at the end of the, in the final issue of the first run, Gerber made himself a character in the book, and uh, he said he was just documenting Man Thing's adventures. But now he had to go away cool. and do something else. So, uh, so, so then in the the second series, Chris Claremont put himself as a character in the final issue of that run. And I, right. I, think, I, I think I read he, he got stabbed to death. <laughs> I'm not sure, but yeah. I think I've heard of this. Yes. Yeah. So there you go. That was interesting. Now, Michael, are you aware that in 2005 there's a Man Thing movie? Yes, and I was I was going to ask you if you were going to mention that because it's one of the very few Marvel live action adaptations that I've never seen. Yeah, I've never seen it. Um, yeah, but you know, on the LCS show, we watch a terrible movie every week, and uh, one, okay. of, one of our loyal listeners suggested, "Hey, maybe uh, do Man Thing." Uh, that would be cool. Yeah, maybe we'll check that out at some point. Maybe you can invite me on the episode. Hey! That'd be great. Woo! Yeah, maybe we could. Maybe that'd be cool. Could. So, all right. Uh, anything else about Man Thing you'd like to say, Michael? Uh, not really. I mean, I you know I tried to read a couple issues, and they're definitely well done because I like Steve Gerber. But I think my one issue with the character is he's mute, right? So, oh yeah, you're not really talk about that. Yeah, he doesn't. Yeah, we, yeah, you're not really following him. You're kind of more following the supporting characters. So that's just one thing I don't like about him. But yeah, we should talk about that. He uh, his powers because he has powers. Uh, he can like uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Like psychically sense uh, people's emotions, right? So and, and uh, if he senses someone that is a fear, uh, he he can burn them. <laughs> like the the catchphrase right. Gerber came up with: "Whatever knows fear burns at the man thing's touch." So, yeah. Yes. So if you just look at man thing, you're like, "Oh, that's a cool little guy, no problem." <laughs> but if you look at him and you get terrified, he could kill you. So, nice. <laughs> yeah. Just like, like a dog, he, right? In a way. Uh, but yeah, he touches him and like he releases some sort of uh, acidic secretion through right. his hands. Burns that, that bur literally burns them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think I read one time he fused the guy's hand to an axe because he burned Ooh. Him. Yeah, that's not good. Really? And like that Do lady some. who betrayed him, his lover, who is the devil spy. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, 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 he grabbed her by the face, burned her face. Ooh, really? The dick. Yikes. Yeah. What a dick man thing. That's the man <laughs> thing. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and I guess uh, he's strong and he's super durable and his body can like, he can change the shape. Like his body can squeeze through things. So he's like living vegetation. You know, he can do that. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, like in this issue, we see a jeep run into him, and it you know just squishes right into his body. Mm -hmm. Doesn't hurt him anyway. All right, and uh, th like we mentioned, this issue features the full killer. There's been a lot of full killers over the year. I think there's been like four. This is the first one, and his first appearance was in issue three. And okay. this issue, we get his backstory, so we really don't have to talk too much about it. Um, but Michael, the, when I think full killer, I always think of that cover. I never read the issue. But Amazing Spider-Man, I think 225. There's a famous cover. Yes, uh, that's right. Full body, full killer, like like a giant, and all these little Spider-Men like swinging yeah. around them. That's right. Yeah. Uh, have you read that issue? Yes, I have. Uh, it wasn't that good though. It was not very good. It was no, not. It wasn't Steve Gerber. It was... Right. It wasn't Steve Gerber. Exactly. I think it was Roger Stern, right? Or... I 
think so. But I just remember it not being great. However, I did read the 1990 Fool Killer miniseries or whatever it was. It was like 10 issues or something. That was good. And that was written by Steve Gerber. Uh, for those who don't know who we're talking about, to describe what he looks like. Because I think they probably have seen him if they haven't. Uh, Fool Killer? Well, he's kind of dressed like... Um, hold on a sec here. I just want to see if this one's the same. Yeah, I guess they're all... Yeah, so he's got like a basically all black skin tight outfit with black boots black gloves, um, a white belt that I don't know if that's a skull or if that's just nothing. I don't know what that is on his belt. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at it too. I have no idea. Right. And then he has like a big, what kind of hat would you call this? It's kind of like, uh, I, I always think of like a Buccaneers hat. Like, yeah. Uh, Tampa of Buccaneers or something. But uh, yeah, a big hat with like a sash on it. A red a sash. Time. Does he have a yeah. Flowers? Well, it's kind of like, I think it's a sash, yeah. yeah and then, I mean, in like, later appearances, is it, all, is it always a sash? Or is it a I sash? think it is, yeah. I'm looking at, like, his Marvel Universe appearance, and that's what it, it's like a sash, yeah. All right, all right. And then he's got, like, a, sort of like a Zorro, you know, black domino mask over his eyes, and his eyes are white, so you can't see his eyes. And, and his big weapon is a laser gun called the Purity Ray. Yeah. And it, like, it just burns people alive, basically. And it's funny because when I was a kid and I read, you know, about this character, I always thought that like Fool Killer was maybe a reference to some medieval biblical concept, you know. No, it's just he just kills fools. That's all. Yeah, Killer, that's his gimmick. You know? He goes around yeah. killing. Yeah. I love it. Like I said, this issue gets into his backstories. So we'll cover it in detail once we get in here. Right. All right. You ready, Mike Hill? That's right. Yep. All right, so Man Thing, Marvel Comics Group, the most startling swamp creature of all. In other words, even more startling than the Swamp Thing. Right? <laughs> That's right. I love how they put that in there. Yeah. Uh, we got this awesome logo, the Man Thing. And then we've got 20 cents, number four, April. And we've got a weird, not a corner box, but a corner circle. In this corner circle, Man Thing is not even looking at the camera, he's looking away. Yeah, his back's to the camera, and he's slinking through the swamp. He's kind of right. like, it uh, looks like Bigfoot emerging from the woods. Right. And then we've got this really cool cover of Swamp Thing, yeah. or sorry, whoops, whoops, uh, <laughs> Man Thing, sorry, coming out of the swamp, and he's attacking two people who are kind of like falling backward in like a Jeep. But I must say, this color is freaking awesome. And yeah, this is a Gil Kane art here. Ah, there you go. And it's also colored really well because the yeah. sky behind him is solid red. And then Man Thing is green, but there's a yellow glow of the headlights on him, and it's just awesome. It's a great and even cover. Even the sky, like there's a, it's really dark red at the top, and it like right, red down. Right. Yeah, the coloring here, I don't know who colored the cover. It's great though. Anyway, yeah. So let me crack this sucker open. Uh, Stan Lee presents Man Thing. The title of the story is "The Making of a Madman." And basically, Fool Killer has just supposedly murdered the man thing. So yeah, we shot him in the belly with his purity ray. Right. So he's standing in the swamp over top of the man thing. We see alligators in the back that I guess are also dead. And man thing is like, you know, got a gaping wound in his chest and he's laying there, like obviously dead. Then there's all these civilians in the background. And they're kind of just talking about the fact that Fool Killer just killed him. Yeah, I guess in the previous issue, there was a big flood, and mm -hmm. uh, Man Thing saved these people from the flood. Okay, okay. Probably they're all there together. And also, I guess uh, Fool Killer also shot their helicopter out of the sky. Because the guy's like, first you shoot my copter out of the sky, and then you open fire on that monster. And there's like a family behind him, you know, of kids and stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a mother and her two children. And yeah, this <sighs> right. guy, I guess, was flying the helicopter that, to get them out of the flooded swamp area. Right, right, right. So then, uh, so then they start arguing back and forth, and and Fool Killer brings up the fact that you know basically this was ordained by God, right? So you can't argue with that, right? And so they're arguing back and forth, and then he's like, "Wait, you?" And then Fool Killer's like, "You dare to scoff at me and deny heaven in one breath, you fool!" And he holds up his uh, his gun. What is it called again? His purity ray. The, the purity ray. Right, and then he shoots this guy. Blows yeah. him away. And then in the narration says, and, and an instant later, he car uh, he carries it out. The pilot dies horribly but quickly. And we see that this guy's basically 
his flesh has been sin- like from his face has been singed from his body like it's gone right and then we see the mother and the kids gasping in horror and then fool killer just runs away and he's like yeah. do not mourn for him like any fool he deserves only righteous contempt he suffered the fate of all who do not know me for his me- for his messenger he suffered the wrath of the fool killer so yeah sent from god right there right so then we cut over to a oh, we, see, we see the full color driving away in his red convertible yes <laughs> yes yes he's driving away and we see his red sash i think coming yeah. out of the top there. that's funny um but then we cut back to the man thing in the swamp and sure enough he's not dead right because he still has like 22 more issues to go or whatever it is 39 <laughs> so he uh, 22 but 18 20... more yeah. yeah there you go but then he comes out, so then he basically stands up, and he's A-OK, but like we said earlier, he can't talk. That's a great shot, though, of him. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, I love this. He comes out of the swamp, and all, you know the family's scared, and the kids are like, Ma, tell him we need help. Maybe, he'll under- maybe he'd understand. But the narration says, he does understand, though not on a verbal level. He feels their plight, and some tiny flicker of hum- humanity left within him causes him to respond. So I don't know if he's like nodding or whatever, but he also just he just walks away, right? Oh uh, yeah, he turned away to go get help. Right. So then we cut over back over to Fool Killer driving his red car, and he's driving along, and we cut across to this other group of people. This is a guy and a girl driving a van here. Mike L, this is Ruth Hart and Richard Rory. You know oh, Richard Rory. Wait, what's he from? We read him in the issue of She Hulk. <laughs> Remember, uh, Wait, Steve Gerber created like Richard that. Rory. He's basically himself. He uh, created a character named Richard Rory, who's a disc jockey and a perpetual loser. <laughs> That's what he was. And in She-Hulk, he was vying for She-Hulk's love with that guy named Zapper, who looked like Gabe Kaplan. <laughs> okay, okay. But Remember wait, that I, love? Yeah, but that was not written by Steve Gerber, was it? I don't think. Uh, oh. But yeah, there's like a love triangle going on. And then in the final issue with She-Hulk, She-Hulk uh, goes with Zapper. Gabe Kaplan, and we just see uh, Rory walking away as a loser in the back. Oh, that's right. That greatest <laughs> ending of all time. I remember that now. Okay. Yeah, that's, okay. that's this guy. Wow. Okay. So uh, it's good to see him back. Okay. So, anyway, so yeah, he's driving along, and sure enough, we see Fool Killer coming towards him. But Fool Killer, he's kind of zoning out, right? He's not really paying, att- paying attention to what's happening on the road. So he nearly hits this van head on, and then. The woman is like, oh, no, I actually, I love this dialogue. The guy's like, it sure is lucky that guy came along and loaned us that can of gas, or we'd still be stuck back there. With my luck, we might have spent the rest of our lives communing with the alligators. Richard, look out! And then he almost hits him. And then the woman's like, oh, man, was that close? He almost, Richard, what is it? What's wrong? And then Richard's like, I know that costume, Maniac Ruth. I mean, not personally, but I know who he is. I love that. And he's here just to see me die. I mean... We don't watch football games together. We don't go to the bar and hang out. Yeah, but yeah. I, know. <laughs> I love it. So anyway, so then um, well, we also see Fool Killer uh, Thought Bubbles saying <laughs> that he recognized Rory. Right, right. He's like Rory. No doubt assumes I failed to recognize him. The fool. I knew I'd pass him on this road, but for <laughs> now I have other matters to attend to. Mike must be told of my good works. Yes. Mike L must be told him. Mike yes. He's driving <laughs> so then, to Canada. Yeah, we, we see his red sash flailing in the wind there. I love it. So then he um he he's driving towards his like truck thing, and he yeah acts, he, he apparently has an eighteen wheeler that's right. automated and just drives around. <laughs> and, yeah, and he and he pushes a button on his car and like a ramp comes down on the eighteen wheeler and he drives in the back of it and then it shuts up and you know, he's, very, he's inside very seventies yeah. So he goes inside and he gets out and we find out that he has a dead body suspended in liquid in this one of those, you know, what is that called? Like, like from outside. Yeah, like a big <laughs> yeah. tube with like tubes connected to it. Kind of like Mr. Freeze's wife, but this is yes. before Mr. Freeze, yeah. So he's like yelling at the tube and he's like, I made a mistake, Mike. The first mistake I've ever made in my life. Oh, I made a victory of it, Mike, but it was still an error. So he's flashing back, right? He's flashing back to, uh, what is this? This is the Korean. No, 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 this is. That's his dad dying in the final days of World War II. Right. His dad died in World War II, and then his mom died in Korea. 
he was on a his nurse. Ninth birthday, right. A nurse cut down by a commie bomb. That's right. That's right. And then he's like, I am the man who was born a cripple who could never hope to give his life that way. But I worship my parents, turned my bedroom into a kind of memorial to them. And I read book after book about the military until my grandmother said I knew more about its history and traditions than most generals. But then somewhere along the way, he meets this preacher. Oh, yeah, I love this. So he meets this preacher and kind of becomes, you know, wrapped up in his, you know, teachings. And then the guy's well, like. preacher is Reverend Mike. Oh, yes. Yes. So he, yes. He's the guy in the tube. Right. We're going to find out why he's in the tube in a minute, right? And so he is also a healer. And so he manages to heal this guy, uh, Fool Killer, when he was a kid. And so now Fool Killer can walk. So he's walking around. He's all good to go. And he's kind of like also helping be a preacher. You know, he's like learning from him. And, and now everyone's kind of like worshiping this guy and calling him a new messiah. And everything's great, right? And then, uh, and, then he, and, then, <laughs> and then it says, but even though I could see I was winning over all who heard my voice, I was still deeply troubled. There I was, heaven's 18-year-old gift to the earth, and the world was coming apart all around me. And we see all these protests and, like, poli- like I don't know if these are police beatings, but just violence in the streets, you know, and whatever. Just all this chaos going on. You know, this is, like, 19, what, 72? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, this was, he's talking here in the 60s. Probably. 60s, right. So, like, a lot of protests and stuff going on. So then he's like, oh, yeah, he's like, all through the 60s, I watched, wondering why I could not save the world, asking myself what I had done wrong. And then the answer came to me. Our times called for a different breed of savior, an active agent against the fools. And so this is where he becomes fool killer, right? We actually see him sewing his costume, (laughs) you know, getting that hat with a red sash. And he's like, I had sewn my new garb. I wanted to show it to you and to tell you I was leaving the revival. So he's going to look for Reverend Mike to tell him the good news. Yeah. Uh oh, but what happens? He opens up the door without knocking. Sure enough, Reverend Mike is chilling out with a uh, a beautiful lady on his couch with all these doll like dollar bills laying on her on her on her lap, right? And yeah, they're, they're boozing it up, Michael. Yeah, they're, they're drinking a bottle of wine. Oh, look at this. Yeah, she's got like a martini glass and he's just got a whole bottle of booze in his hand. And right. he looks up at him and he's smiling. Hey, look at me. <laughs> right. And then, and then he's like, Fool Killer's like, and then I saw it all, Mike, so clearly. I'll never forget the awful words you spoke to me that night, Mike. You take life too seriously, you said. You should relax. Stop fighting the whole world. Then I knew that you too had become one of the fools, and that left me no choice, Mike. I had to kill you. You make <clears> so, no mention of what happened to the lady, though. Do you think he killed the lady? Good point. That's a good question. I don't know. So he's like, uh, so he's like, yeah, but you were the man who gave the world it's Redeemer, Mike. So I made you my shrine, my symbol to the route to heaven. So yeah, that's why he's preserved in, the, in this formaldehyde, I guess, right? Yeah, obviously, like, he's telling all this to Mike, but Mike's but dead. Mike is- right, and right. So he's really just telling it to the reader, but you can get away with it just because he's supposed to be insane. So you're like, alright, exactly. I'll let an insane guy can do this. <laughs> like, this blatant exposition. Oh, and I love this, too. The money you took in from the caravan, Mike, it bought me all this. The computer, the ray of purity weapon, and that and your death atone for all your sins and then he shows a like a little dis- computer display of all the people he, uh that he's i guess he's killed or he's gonna kill this is the mission he's on now in florida to kill these three people we got all oh, right uh, we got theodore salas man thing he, he killed him uh then this uh schist guy r.a mm-hmm. schist he's a uh he's like a land developer and he's ravaging nature in the swamps and stuff. So he wants to kill him for that. And then Richard Rory, our buddy, Richard Rory, he wants to kill him. Right. <laughs> Cause Richard Rory was a disc jockey and he was playing blasphemous music. Hey, right. kill all <laughs> disc jockeys. Right. I love it. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And remember he assumes he thinks man thing is dead. So he thinks that mission is accomplished. Right. Yeah. So then we cut back to the family. Oh, they're still hanging out with the swamp thing. So this is good. Or the man thing. thing. Whoops. Come on, Michael. Whoops. How could I mix them up? (laughs) Anyway, so then we see um, this Jeep coming down the road. And sure enough, it's driven by Mr. Schist. Yeah. And uh, the guy. Driven by him. Driven by his lackeys. Yeah, (laughs) right. And the lackeys, one of the lackeys like, Mr. Schist, it's the man thing. What will I do? Do. When my when my life is in danger, what do you suppose, you dunce? 
If you value your job, man, run him down. Y yes, sir. So he smashes the Jeep into the man thing, but the man thing doesn't budge, right? It just kind of like crashes into him like he's a big pile of vegetation. And, uh, and ugh, I like this. L look, sir, he's backing up, oozing off the front of the car. He's going to let us pass, I think. <laughs> uh, and then the family comes out of the, uh, like the, the reeds or whatever. They kind of come out and they're like, um, and then, oh yeah, I, I love this. Then the guy's like, or, or sorry, wait, um, let me back up. He's like, uh, Mr. Shits is like, then why did he stop us? There has to be a catch. And the lackey's like, yeah, and here it comes, I bet. And Mr. Shits is like, keep your eyes on that swamp devil. I'll handle this. So the mother of the two kids comes out of like the weeds. She's like, there's nothing to handle. We need a ride, that's all, to the nearest town, please. You're not serious. What What do you mean? So they're arguing back and forth. And basically, Man-Thing taps the guy on the shoulder and is like just staring at him. And the guy's like, uh, all right, we'll be glad to help. So well, he doesn't up, touch him, Mike. Yo. He doesn't touch him because if he did, he'd have burned him. So ah, just, like, good point. He just points his finger at him, and, right. and the guy stares into Man Thing's red eyes. And that's a great and shot. Yeah, the, yeah. Very the, the art here we'll talk about later. Uh, not always great, but he draws Man Thing. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, very good. But yeah, this this shyest guy, he doesn't want to give him a ride because his life's been threatened, and he's in a hurry to get out of there. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. school killers after. Him. He's all right. He's like, all right, lady, get your kids in here. We'll take you. Right. So they hop in and they're off. And then, so now, <laughs> so now they're driving down the road, and they pass by. Um, this is uh, what's his name? This is uh, what's the fool killer's name? They never reveal it here. But oh, I think okay. Later on, someone mentions that it was a uh, it was some like uh, spin off of Steve Gerber's Steve Gerber's name like jumbled up uh, Everbest or something the last name. Oh, okay. Um, I can't remember. But yeah, maybe. Oh, maybe oh, you what? Go ahead. Ross G Everbest. Yeah. Um, I guess that was Steve Gerber's like pseudonym or something. Uh, I don't know when. Cool. But, um, but anyway, uh, maybe that truck isn't automated. Maybe it's just parked along the side of the road. It looked like yeah, it was I driving. think it was. It looked like it was driving on the road, though, when he went in it. Yeah. Confusing. But anyway. So then the truck, so Fool Killer sees them driving by. He knows who it and is. So he he's jumped. not in his costume, by the way, either. He's right, 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 right. He's in his secret identity of Ross G. Eberbest. <laughs> so the Jeep goes by, and he's like, something hauntingly familiar about that Jeep. Or, or the people in the flood victims and schist. He choose he chose to ignore the warning. He's trying to elude me. And for that, he forfeits the few hours left to him. The fool. So then he jumps in his truck and starts driving. But then the lackeys in the Jeep realize they're being followed. So then now Fool Killer is chasing after this Jeep full of people. And he smashes into it. And all the people go flying. And they're all fucking dead. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. Like you see the mother and the kids like just go flying out of the Jeep. Right. It's crazy. Wow. So I'm like, well, I can't believe Gerber. He, first, he had he shot that pilot guy in the face with the gun and killed him and just melted him. And now he just killed a family. Like, oh, right. God. No that mercy is... for this guy, eh? So then we cut over. Now, this is Richard Rory, right? Yeah, Richard Rory is now in this, like, diner hanging out with his girlfriend. And then, uh, I love this. I love this. Then they they see... Okay, oh, so, so this is... um. This is no. Who's coming up in the red car? This is uh. This is the oh. guy who gave them the tank of gas or the can of gas. Oh, okay. So like the guy. Don't see, I don't know if that that was shown in the last issue, but they just mentioned that earlier in this. Issue. Right. So when the guy walks in, Richard Roy's like, "Hey, hi, Ruth. It's the guy whose gas got us to these watered down cokes. What brings you to this place? Was your country club closed, or, or did your car break down, or oh Lord, your car?" You're him. You're the fool killer. What? Uh, no, because it's the red car, right? Yeah. No, stop. Are you crazy? What? Oh, you bet I'm crazy, right? And then you see in the background, fool killer's truck is driving towards the diner. And so as they're like yelling at each other, uh, in the background, the, the truck's driving, driving, and then it smashes through the window. And this is my favorite dialogue of the whole book. The girl says, Richard, Richard, look out. His brakes almost, his, his, his brakes must have failed. Or no. I can see it on his face. He did this on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in mind, 
that all that dialogue is in one panel where she's jumping out of the way of a speeding truck that just crashed through right. the wall of the diner. I love it. I love it. She had time this to do all that. Right. Uh, this is great. I can see it in his face. Yeah. Awesome. I love stuff like that. Anyway, so then uh, Fool Killer in his plain clothes gets out of the truck, grabs Richard Rory, throws him over his, over his shoulder, and then throws him in the truck and takes off. So now, yeah. now he's gone. And so then he's driving, I guess, back the other way. And well, then like, sure enough. Well, one more thing about the diner. When, when he's leaving, uh, <laughs> the girl's like, what are we going to do? He'll kill Richard if we don't stop him. And the diner owner says, yeah, well, I ain't risking my life for some long hair, for some hippie long hair. <laughs> right, right. Damn hippie. Awesome. <laughs> Easy ride. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. hey, hey, diner guy, the, he just crashed through your diner. With this I know, eh? Like your, no your diner is ruined, and dead. But he's not going to call the cops. He doesn't want to get involved. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. So then, yes. Yeah, so then, full killer. Now he's driving back towards uh, the group of people that he just tried to kill, but they're all alive. Yeah, somehow they survived that jeep crash. I have no idea. Right. So then he gets out of the truck and he's yelling at Mister Schist, right? And he's like, you should be dead unless, of course, this was some divine plan for you to suffer before you sleep as you have made nature suffer. So be it then. You and Rory will die together. So he like chops him, karate chops him on the back on the side of the neck and then throws him in the truck with him and then takes off. And then we see man thing watching them drive away. Right. And then uh, and then. Oh, yeah. So then he leads them. He pulls a gun on them and leads them. Where are they now? Out of the truck? It's confusing. Yeah, Yeah, like to the swamp. And then all of a sudden, Swamp Thing is behind him. He comes up behind Fool Killer and he puts his hand on him, but nothing happens yet. He's and then and then the Fool Killer turns around. He's in plain clothes again. He's like, I killed you. I saw you die. Your evil burned away by the ray of purity. You can't come back from the dead. And then uh Mr. Schist is running away. And then Fool Killer's like, that would make you the Messiah and me. It would make me nothing, nothing. But that's nonsense. More than that, it it is vile, vile um, heresy. There can be nothing holy but a walking mass of slime, a mockery of life. Stay back. I am his living incarnation. Do you hear me? Not you. Fear. Uh oh, fear. You know what? The, you know what that means, Mike Dell. <laughs> right. So now, sw- or, yeah, man thing reaches at his hand, and then it's the narration, the single emotion, the man thing loathes. It courses like fire through the fil- fool killer's nerves. And like fire, fear consumes him at, as his faith in his own divinity is shaken at last. The monster lashes out, grasps the killer's hand. And whatever knows fear burns at the man-thing's touch. So then we see that his gun, fool killer's gun hand is all kind of like smoking now, right? Like it's all been burned. Yeah, and uh, man then uh, around to leave. He's like, all right, I'm done here. There's no beef. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, this is Richard Rory, right? Richard Rory leaps towards uh, Fool Killer, but Fool Killer still has his gun kind of burned to his hand, and then well, he shoots it and it his br- hands. If you notice, it switches hands. So I it, uh, it like okay, the, the gun should have been fused to his hand, but uh, then now uh, it uh, he swaps hands with it. But uh, yeah, he's about to shoot Man Thing in the back, so uh, Rory sneaks up behind him and spears him from behind, tackles him. right, right. But then the gun goes off and shoots. The glass holding, what's this guy's name again? Reverend Mike, the dead body. Right, Reverend. right, right. And then he just falls out. And as that's happening, a giant piece of glass flies out and hits Fool Killer in the chest. And he's like, Mike, what have I done to... Ah! And then the narration says, Mike's body collapses across his protégés and the holy war is ended. And then Richard Rory says, what a lousy way to die, even for a killer. But maybe it's poetic justice, sort of, even if we never know what the rhyme was. <laughs> the end. Yeah, the, the sequence of events there is just uh, impossible. Like, uh, yes. the, the minute that, that ray gun, like, uh, Fool Killers is back to the tube. So the gun goes up behind his head and shoots the tube and it explodes. Yet somehow he has enough time to turn around, even though he's on his knees when he's getting tackled. He turns around. Faces the tube just enough time for that plexiglass shard to go right through his heart. Like, Ridiculous. Uh, yeah. But uh, the ending was just so quick and out of nowhere, you know, like mm-hmm. final two panels of the book. 
he just gets plexiglass glass in the heart and dies. It's like, wait, where did that happen? Like, it just came out of nowhere. What the fuck? Right, right. A little rushed. Yeah, a little rushed. <laughs> so there it is, man. Thing so, yeah. Woo. How about that, Mike. First experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, to say the least. Yeah, I uh, I gotta tell you, I like Man Thing more than Swamp Thing. That's a hundred percent sure. Uh, well, here's the thing. Uh, I've read some good uh, Swamp Thing in my day by Alan Moore, and this is not as good as that. However, it is Steve Gerber is a good writer, so this was very entertaining. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, it was not great, but it was fun. Like, it, right. there's a lot of goofiness in it, but it was fun. Um, yeah, and it had a great cover by Yo Kane. Let's not forget that cover spectacular but i just like the the man thing uh visual look better than the swamp thing oh okay well yeah and i and i like his origin i I would have liked swamp thing better if they just kept his origin the same i don't like all that fairy nonsense with the mystic all that what oh it's the best it's the best that's what makes swamp fairies or whatever yeah (laughs) not a fan but uh yeah, Full Killer was interesting. I'd never read any Full Killer stuff. Yeah, he's almost like a, a funny, funnier version of the Punisher, right? Yeah, uh, not intentionally funny, but yeah, he's. Um, yeah. Th- like, have you read? You said you read other Full Killer stuff. Like, do they explain how other people became the Full Killer? I forgot to read how they explained that. On it, well, yeah, I read it, but I don't remember. But, uh, yeah, not, not, not to say that he's, like, ha-ha funny, but he's clearly absurd, right? Like, yeah. it's all, it borderlines on satire, how ridiculous he is, but almost like a, a parody of, like, religious fanatics, I guess. Yes. So, uh, we yeah. mentioned Gerber, uh, again, he wrote Adventure into Fear 11 through 19, all with the man thing, and then he did all 22 issues of man thing. And uh, we've talked about him many times on the show, so we don't have to get into him. Um, but yeah, the writing here, a lot of narration, a lot of narration. I guess that was the yeah, style of the day. Definitely. But, uh, mm-hmm. A whole lot of narration. And a lot of it was over the top, but you know, it was fun. So what are you going to do? Definitely. Uh, definitely. The artist is Val Mayerick. Uh, he was born in 1950 mm-hmm. in Youngstown, Ohio. And there you go. Oh, nice. That's how I got, how I got him, Val Mayerick. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mentioned earlier he co-created Howard the Duck with Steve Gerber. He broke into Marvel in 1973 doing a bunch of horror stuff. Um, he did issues 13 to 19 of Adventures into Fear and Man Things 1 through 4. He also uh, did some Kazar and mm. uh, Conan the Barbarian. And then in the early 90s, like 92, 93, he did about seven issues of The Punisher. Which seems weird. Ah, cool. And he did a couple issues of Punisher War Journal. He did one issue of Web of Spider-Man. Um, mm, but probably most of his stuff was like horror stuff. Okay. And then he went into doing commercial art for different places. And, uh, so yeah. Oh, Mary. Now, did you do any research on Jack Abel, the inker? I did not. Cause I think that as we were saying, the art is inconsistent, but sometimes like the close-ups are really good or whatever. I think that all has to do with Jack Abel. Cause he's, he's just a really good inker. And so yeah, that's like, why, like, sometimes the storytelling is confusing, but, you know, the shadows are good and the details good. Yeah, the art here is very, like, clunky and it's not, mm-hmm. like, anatomically, it's off a lot. <laughs> it's right, like, it's right, just, right. It's flat and stiff, but whenever he draws a man thing, it looks great. Exactly. Really like what he does with man thing. Like, just the right. way he stands and his positioning. And, and yes, like said, yes. And he's always heavily inked man thing so he right always... but yeah, uh, the rest definitely. of the art and eh, not so much i agree yeah now have you ever read anything else with val mayrick uh i'm i'm sure i've definitely come across him i i must have read that issue web of spider-man because i've read almost all of them so yeah i think it was around sure 149 or something like that oh really uh-huh i'll look it up right now as we're talking but yeah see so, yeah, I, I he's one of those names i've always come across but you know, I just never really, never really stuck out to me, I guess. Pretty sure that's the first thing I ever read. Um, yeah, not a big huh. fan. Not a big fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what can I say? But I enjoyed reading Man Thing. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Steve Gerber, he's always reliable, right? He's always entertaining. Easily the I best think. book named after the penis. 
easily. Than yes, Batman. definitely. Well, not counting Batman. <laughs> it's <laughs> Ooh. Zing. All right. So what do you give it, Mike? <laughs> One out of ten. Oh, man. I'll get, the highest I can go is a six and a half because it's entertaining, oh. but it's also all over the place. Yeah, that's way higher. I was going to go lower, but uh, I love that Gil Kane cover so much. That'll give a bonus point. So uh, I'll go to six. I'll go to six. Okay. You were going to go five? Yeah, but uh, it gets an extra yeah. point for uh, cover. All right, for the cover. There you go. There you go. <sighs> Man thing issue four. Now we here we go. Mike Gale's first pick for Shocktober. Here we go. Horror be, theme. Mike. Well, as you know, every year I always pick one DC and one Marvel. So first I'm going to pick a DC. So this, this is w- one of the few DC horror themed superheroes. I'm not sure if we've come across this guy yet, but I got a feeling you're a fan of this guy. <laughs> We're going to be reviewing the first post crisis appearance of the Spectre. We've done the Spectre already. Oh, but that was pre-crisis. This is (laughs) post-crisis. Yeah. Uh, All right. The Spectre, number one, by Doug Mensch and Gene Colan. Oh, I like Gene Colan. Yeah. It's the real deal right here. It's going to be fun. (laughs) Shocktober. Wait, wait. Say the issue again. The Spectre, number one, from April 1987. 87. Yep. We might have so, a yeah. Miles Watson on the show. I'll check. Awesome. All right. Like yeah. Horror. If, it, if it's horror he's enough horror, for him. Yeah. He's a horror expert. And okay. uh, so I don't know if this will qual- qualify as horror for him, but we'll see. And uh, maybe he'll join us. Awesome. I do like so, the Spectre. I like the Golden Age Spectre. Yes. Well, I, you'll be happy to know, as far as I know, this is a continuation. They don't reboot him. I think it's like. The same Jim Corrigan from the '40s, so that's a great I'm name. Sure you like it, Jim Corrigan. Yeah, it's a cool name. I, I remember when we read the first Spectre. That Jim Corrigan, he, he was a bit of a jerk when he was like, uh, remember that? He was like kind of a creep to his girlfriend. Yeah, right. That's right. I hope, hopefully, he still is. Right. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. But all right. So next week, the Spectre number one, nineteen eighty. That's right. Shocktober. And you can see, you can listen to every episode of Flea Market Fantasy on the Comic Book Syndicate's channel on um, Spotify, Stitcher, or Apple Podcasts. Also, the Comic Book Syndicate Twitter feed, the YouTube channel, and the Comic Book Syndicate website, and the Facebook page. One week, I pick a Bronze Age comic. The next week, Mike Dell picks a Bronze Age comic. So, until next Tuesday, this start!